right, let's open our Bibles this morning to uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I have titled this morning's message, The Opposite of Childlike Faith, because if you'll recall the text from last Sunday in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, was on the necessity of having childlike faith in order to enter into the kingdom of God. So, what is childlike faith? Childlike faith is the simple, confident trust or faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, putting no confidence in the flesh, but depending fully on what God has done redemptively through His Son in order to save you. The man in our text for today although he earnestly sought salvation, ended up walking away from Christ and any hope of salvation because he refused to let go of his works and his idols and to depend upon Christ in that childlike faith. So let's look at our text together and find our place in this story in Mark chapter 10, looking again at verse 17. And as he was setting out, that is Christ setting out, on his journey, this is right after his teaching on childlike faith, a man, almost on cue here, runs to Jesus and knelt before him, and he asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Who is this man? What do we know of him? What is the condition of his heart? There are some clues in our text this morning. In fact, we will consider Matthew and Luke's parallel accounts as well. For example, in Matthew's parallel account, he is described as a young man, probably no older than 30. In Luke's account, he is described as a ruler, probably a, a ruler of a synagogue or some person of authority. In all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this young ruler is described as being rich. And in fact, in Luke's account, the rich young ruler is described as being extremely rich. We can also deduce by his strict adherence unto, unto the moral law of God in verses 19 and 20, where he tells Christ that he has kept all of these commandments from his youth, that he is a moral man, He's well respected and influential in his community. And by his approach to Jesus, running up to him eagerly and then kneeling before Jesus, we see that he had great respect for Christ, calling him good teacher. And he was sincere in his approach to Christ because he asked Jesus that all important question that each of us must ask. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And if you think back on Jesus' ministry, you realize that most people who came to Jesus either wanted something from Him or wanted healing. And here we have this unique example of an individual coming up to Christ and asking Him that all-important theological question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This must have been a refreshing change for Christ. Now, that's what we know about the young man from the Bible. But we can look at history and realize that by the first century standards of a Jewish community, this young man was successful. In fact, he was very successful. He was wealthy. 
in money and lands. He was influential. He had some political clout because money and power often go hand in hand in the ancient world as well as today. He was a very religious and moral man, outwardly moral by Jewish standards, which meant what? It meant that he was earning his salvation or his entrance into the kingdom of God by keeping the law of God. This is a works righteousness. This is earning your entrance into the kingdom of God by your good works. And so he asked Jesus this all-important question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And how does Jesus answer? Well, his initial response is not what we would expect in answer to that question. Look at verse 18. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. Now why in the world would Jesus say that to this earnest and sincere inquirer? By saying that Jesus is a good teacher, isn't this man just being, well, isn't he right? Isn't that right? Isn't Jesus a good teacher? And it's true. Jesus is a good teacher. But apparently this man does not understand the implications of using the word good. He doesn't understand the meaning of the word good as applied to people, as applied to himself, or as applied to God. Who is this man talking to? He's talking to Jesus. Who is Jesus? Now, if I were to ask you that question, you, you know the answer. Jesus is God incarnate. He is God Himself. God in human flesh. However, this young man doesn't realize that. He doesn't know to whom he is talking. As far as this rich young ruler, this very moral and upright Jewish uh, man. Jesus is a rabbi, a teacher, or maybe a prophet, but a good one nonetheless. But he's not God. And what Jesus wants this young man to realize is that he is in fact talking to God himself. Only God is good. And we'll unpack that in just a minute. But let's establish the most important point here at this point in this, in this uh, sermon. If a person is going to be saved, the one primary truth that needs to be nailed down is the identity of Jesus Christ. And this young man, for all of his sincerity, had missed it. Jesus is who he claimed to be. Jesus is God in human flesh. He is Almighty God Himself. Now, this young man was considered good by his community. This young man considered himself good because he tells Jesus that he has kept the law of God Himself. But the Bible says that there are none good. Paul, the apostle quoting two Psalms, writes in Romans 3, 10 through 12, None is righteous, no, not one. None understands. No one seeks, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now based on the biblical definition of good as applied to man and God, there is no human being good. This rich young ruler for all of his assets and for all of his clout and for all of his morality was not good. He was not a good man. Only God is good. God alone is good. Jesus is God. Therefore, Jesus is good. And man is not good, but evil. In order for this young man to be saved, he must believe that Jesus is God, and that Jesus 
as God alone is good, and he must see in himself that he is not good, that all of his religious works are in vain. They are not good. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means every human being is sinful. That means that this man is sinful. So in order for Jesus to show this rich young ruler his sin, he takes him to the law. He takes him to that place where this young man says, I am righteous. Jesus is going to show him that rather than being a keeper of the law, this rich young ruler is a breaker of God's law. Look at verse 19. Jesus takes him to the second table of the law here. You know the commandments. Do not murder. That's the sixth commandment. Do not commit adultery. That is the seventh. Do not steal. The eighth. Do not bear false witness. That's the ninth commandment. Do not defraud. And obviously you don't recognize that as being a part of the second table of the law. In fact, it's an application of the tenth commandment. You shall not covet. Defrauding is a concrete example of covetousness and it is a temptation that is particular to those who have power and wealth. Defrauding your neighbor is showing lack of love to your neighbor. Hoarding your wealth is breaking the tenth commandment of coveting. And then of course he mentions the fifth commandment. Last, honor your father and mother. So the question becomes, why did Jesus mention to this rich young ruler the second table of the law rather than the first? Because the Ten Commandment, Commandments are divided into two parts. The first four commandments relate to our relationship to God, while the remaining six commandments relate to our relationship to one another. You would think that you would start with the first table of the law because our relationship to God is the most important and the one that needs to be settled first. So why did Jesus appeal to the second table of the law? I think the reason is because you can tell about a person's relationship with God by their relationship to other people. You see, a hypocrite can fake devotion to God, but a hypocrite's hypocrisy is easier to detect in their relationship with other people. Getting to know this person better, seeing what they're really like with their family, seeing what they're like in public, hearing their casual conversations. So in answering this man's question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, Jesus takes him to the moral law of God because this man believed that he had kept the moral law of God, but what we see is that he hasn't. Now, verse 20, the young man gets to respond to Jesus. And notice this is crucial, and I'll explain it in a minute. He leaves off good when he addresses Jesus now. It's very telling, isn't it? And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Probably meaning that from the age of 13, he became a Jewish boy, became bar mitzvah, a child or son of the commandment. It's the age in which a Jewish boy becomes responsible for obeying the law of God. And in his mind, he has kept these commandments. From my youth, I have kept them. Now the problem is that while he has kept the letter of the law, he has failed to keep the spirit of the law, therefore he has broken the law. Now what does that mean? Well, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount addresses a couple of issues pertaining to keeping the law. One is... Uh, anger and murder, and the other that we're going to look at very quickly is lust and adultery. This young man had never actually physically murdered another person. 
But Jesus, in explaining the spirit of the law, described anger and hatred as being equivalent to murder. So if you have ever held anger and hatred for someone, you have committed heart murder, and you have broken the law. Again, Jesus uses the second example of adultery and lust. This rich young ruler probably hadn't actually engaged in a physical act of fornication, committing adultery. But if he had ever lusted after another one, then he has committed adultery in his heart. He has lusted after someone. And the same would be true for all the commandments of God. And this rich young ruler may have never broken any of these commandments outwardly, but because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he has broken the commandments inwardly. And as a result, this rich young ruler was not a law keeper, but a law breaker. Only when we become conscious of our own law breaking do we flee to Christ for salvation because He kept the law for us and suffered the penalty for our law breaking. But this young man didn't see it that way. He was so self-deceived into believing that he was perfect before the law of God. Now in Matthew's parallel account we gain a little more insight into this young man's true condition. For after the statement, all these I have kept, we read this, the young man said this, what do I still lack? Now this tells us the condition of this young man's heart. Even though he was a success by uh, standards of his day, and even by standards of today, there was something missing in his life that his wealth and power and religion could not supply. And that's why he runs to Christ, that's why he asks Christ, is there anything that I have failed to do in order to inherit eternal life? Good teacher, what must I do? Now by asking Jesus what he must do, what must I do as this rich young ruler to make sure that I have eternal life? He was asking and looking, I should say, in the wrong direction. Because there was nothing in that young man that he could do to save himself. True salvation is of God and not of man. You see how far this young man was from the truth? And he was standing face to face with Jesus. When Jesus said, by calling me good, you're basically saying I'm God because only God is good. And did he repent at, at, at that statement and say, Christ, you are God? No, he didn't. He stopped calling him good. Because he didn't think Jesus was God. Just a good rabbi. Good teacher. This man was so far from Christ, it wasn't even funny. It was sad and heartbreaking. And he had the truth staring him in the face, and yet he persisted in his unbelief. In verse 21, look at the heart of Christ now. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Again, he needed to believe that Jesus was God, and he didn't. He needed to believe that he was a lawbreaker rather than a law keeper, and he didn't. And so in love for this young man, who was deceived and lost, Jesus, like a very skilled surgeon, puts the scalpel to the cancer that is eating this young man alive. It is his God-replacing idol of material wealth. It wasn't that in order to be a Christian, everybody has to give up everything that they have. But if everything you have comes before God, then that's an idol that is replacing God and you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven with idols. God must be first. Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And this is what Jesus so skillfully and carefully does with this young man. He brings him to the point of realizing that Jesus is God, or I should say, the need to realize that Jesus is God and that He's a lawbreaker 
Not only in spirit breaking all the commandments, but there's one specific commandment that he's breaking, and that's worshiping another God besides the one true God. And he wouldn't part, sadly, he would not part with this idol. Verse 22, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So in love, Christ lays his heart bare, revealing his true nature, unveiling this man's corrupted heart so that Jesus could apply the cure. And it's always that way with the gospel. We are all lawbreakers. We are guilty. And there's nothing in the world that we can do to inherit eternal life save repent of our sin and turn to faith alone in Christ alone for salvation. Repent of the gods that we have enthroned in our hearts, whatever they are. For the young man, it was his earthly wealth. But there are many other idols besides earthly wealth. Anything, again, that comes before God is an idol. Anything that you will not part with in order to follow Christ is an idol. And as long as that idol remains enthroned in your heart, you will never, ever enter the kingdom of God. What are the idols maybe that are keeping you from Christ today? Maybe it's not the idol of material wealth, but maybe it's this other idol that we see in this young man's life, and that is the idol of self-righteousness. Over and over again, in my experience as a pastor, talking with someone who is dying, Inevitably, the first thing that is brought up when they are approached with the thought of, are you ready to meet God, is this. I have been not the best person, but I have done many good things. I tried to go to church. I tried to be kind. One man even said, I hope God will take that into it account. Now what does that tell you? It says that we are relying on our good works rather than Christ. And that was at the heart of this young rich ruler 2,000 years ago. And it's a heart problem that persists through every generation. Remember, there is nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. Salvation is a work of God, not a work of man. That is why we cast our idols aside, crush them, destroy them. Metaphorically speaking, because sometimes an idol is someone you love that comes between you and God. That you need to put God first and then love this person properly. Repent of our idols and turn to Jesus Christ by faith alone. You see, there's not enough good works you can do to save yourself. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the glory of, of, of Christ is this, that He kept the law perfectly in thought and in action. And that is attributed or imputed to you. Your law breaking is covered by Jesus' law keeping. And not only did Jesus keep the law for you, He also suffered the punishment due for your law breaking. The sinless dying for the sinful to atone for our sins, to redeem us unto God, to grant us everlasting life. In childlike faith, casting away the idols of your destruction turning in faith to the one who can truly save you, Jesus Christ.
And remember the heart, at the heart I should say of salvation, is the last section of verse 21 where Jesus tells the young man to repent and give away his idols, to destroy his idols as it were, telling him he'd have treasure in heaven. He says this, and come, follow me. Coming to Christ is not just getting eternal life, getting saved and then going back to life, doing whatever. Getting saved means to follow Christ, to obey Him and to serve Him, to be His church on this earth. I don't know where you are today in your relationship to God, but you know that the way to salvation is through God's Son, Jesus Christ. And if there's idols cluttering your heart, they need to go. And God needs to reign supreme here. I'm going to end this service in just a moment with prayer, but I would like to encourage you, if you have questions, worries or fears about something in your life, a doubting of assurance or the need to turn to Christ and believe, the need for prayer, if we're friends on Facebook, you can, you can message me or you can uh, leave a message on the church answering machine and I will check that. That number is 1-270-508-5798. That's not it. 258-5798. Always get that wrong, don't I? 258-5798. And I'll check that and I'll return your call as quick as I can. Now what I'd like to do when I pray is uh, for you to join with me. If you're watching this later, it takes a while to upload it. Now just stop and pray, and let's go together now in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you for the truth that we've heard. We thank you that Christ has taken the work out of salvation in terms of our works. Let each one who is listening today, Lord, cast aside the idols of their heart and turn to you in faith alone for eternal salvation. And let us, Lord, follow you as faithful disciples in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.